Hey, 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 how are you doing? I really would want to welcome you from each part of the world that you might be listening to this. Um, today, I'd love to speak about corporate governance. Now, I do want to emphasize that this is not a teaching video, but it is basically a video that will basically help us to understand uh, corporate governance as an area a bit better. My name is Roger Gitonga and I'm an AA expert tutor. I hope that you will most definitely enjoy this ride with me. Now, I must say for a fact that first and foremost there's a higher percent chance of this area being tested in section A. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that it can't be tested in Section B. It's cool also. But we normally find quite a number of objective test case questions of this particular area in Section A. Now, what does this necessarily mean? What does, what does corporate governance really mean? Now, it's the system by which companies or businesses are directed and controlled. And it goes on to say here that the corporate governance structure specifies the distribution of rights and responsibilities among different participants in the corporation and spells out the rules and the procedures for making decisions on corporate affairs. By doing this, it also provides the structure through which the company objectives are set and the means of, of attaining those objectives and monitoring performance. Whew. My God, I, I, I can only imagine that I already lost you when, when I went through that. So I'd want to really just simplify because I'm guessing you're asking me, what do you actually mean? So honestly, uh, to be very honest, it's just basically how your company is being, is, how is your company being directed? I, th I think these are the questions I'd ask myself. How is your company being directed? Who calls the shots? And um, probably is how the company being directed going to achieve our New Year's resolutions? Oops. I know I might be attacking a few people. Eh? <laughs> Have you achieved your New Year's resolutions? Now, the thing is that I, I, I do want to appreciate the fact that corporate governance almost reminds me of... Um, let me just put it in this way, right? Um, this is my head right now. You can see a headshot, right? And you can see how my particular head is. And I, we do really have to appreciate the fact that the, um, the health of my brain, the health of my thinking is very critical to the functioning of the rest of my body. And it is so interesting to note that um, many times, if there's any particular pain that you might be feeling in any part of your body, it really gives you sleepless nights, whether you have a toothache, something that is so small. A tooth is such a small part of your body, but when it is aching, it could give you hell. Now, I want to do imagine that if this is not okay, then what happens is that everything that I do, my decision making, my steps, everything that I do might not necessarily help me in achieving my lifelong goals, isn't it? Now, if my head is not okay, my body, my decisions, my will, my intention, um, the systems I put around me, the controls, my discipline might not necessarily help me in aligning myself to achieving the goals that I might have set for myself um, for whichever year and or for whichever particular phase of my life so this is almost like corporate governance you know the, the appreciation of the fact that uh, listen if this is the system that of how companies are being directed and controlled and i like the fact that they're putting out the idea of a system because a system basically means this is how we work this is what we do this is how we operate and if a system is not working if a system crashes even in a computer uh basically there's nothing that you can do there's nothing that you can achieve particularly so so this system needs to be so constructed in a manner that helps the company to achieve the goals. It's also in like in our personal life. We need to come up with a system by which we are 
controlled and directed. If, 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 if this system doesn't work adequately well, then we can't achieve our goals. Now, uh, why is this particular area so important in auditing? So the first one is transparency and accountability. Now you might be asking me, Roger, what do you really mean? Now, corporate governance frameworks emphasize transparency and accountability, and they ensure that companies disclose accurate and reliable information. Now, external auditors rely on this information to perform their audits effectively. And you do appreciate the fact that um, transparent financial reporting enables auditors to really just assess the financial health of a company and identify any irregularities. The second thing that we see here is the financial reporting quality. Now, good corporate governance practices, good corporate governance practices contribute to the production, really, of high quality financial statements. Now, external auditors really depend on the accuracy and the completeness of financial information to express an opinion. Effective governance really just helps um, helps reduce the risk of financial misstatements of fraud, all right? Then we have the internal control assessment. Now, corporate governance frameworks um, often include internal control mechanisms. These controls are really critical for the prevention and the detection of errors and fraud. Now, we do know that external auditors evaluate uh, the effectiveness of internal control controls as part of their audit procedures. Now, strong internal controls enhance the reliability of financial reporting. And then we have here independence and objectivity. Now, corporate governance really just emphasizes the independence of or the need for independence of boards um, of directors and audit committees and an independent board basically helps the auditors perform their duties objectively. Now, you do appreciate the fact that external auditors may want to communicate or may mostly communicate directly with the audit committee, which is typically composed of independent directors to discuss audit findings and disclose any concerns that they might particularly have. And then we have here the risk management. Now, Corporate governance frameworks basically include risk management practices and external auditors um, consider the company's risk management processes when planning and conducting audits. Understanding the risk environment basically helps auditors focus on areas with higher inherent risks and tailor their audit procedures accordingly. And we learn this especially in the audit risk aspect. And then we have here the stakeholder conflict. Confidence. Now, corporate governance contributes um, to building and maintaining uh, stakeholder confidence. And external auditors, as external parties, rely on a well-governed um, company to provide accurate and complete info information. So stakeholders trust in the company's governance practices indirectly, um, or other stakeholders trust in that particular framework, really indirectly supports the reliability of financial statements. I really saw the importance of showing us this so that we could really just try to tie down why is corporate governance so important in audit? Why do we study it? You know, we normally find corporate governance featuring in the study hub in chapter three. And many times students might ask, why is this so important in audit? Um, why do we learn it as part of audit? And I've just tried to show us how this is tied through every part of um, the audit syllabus. You know, we can see as far as the auditor's objective is in terms of expressing an opinion, corporate governance is so important because it enhances all these particular factors that I've mentioned that could easily affect the opinion and also the credibility of the financial statements. Now, let's talk a bit. Let me, let me, let's do a bit of a story. 
uh, when I mention here yeah, the big five, I'm not really talking about, um, and, I, and this might trigger in many people's minds, I'm not really talking about, uh, you know, lions and elephants and the buffaloes because those are the big five in the world. I mean, in, in, the, in, the, in the wild, in the wild, not in the world. But I'm talking about the big five audit firms. And some of us might ask ourselves, wait, I know the big four. I know EY, I know PwC, you know. So where, where are the five coming from? So who are the big five? Of course, we know EY, we know KPMG, we know Deloitte, we know uh, PwC, we know these five, four, right? Who have really dominated the audit farm space or the audit farm industry for quite a bit of time. But we had a particular um audit firm known as the arthur anderson what exactly happened to arthur anderson well oops they fell so let's tell a bit of a story now the enron scandal of the early 2000 was described as a catastrophic tale for anderson the audit firm responsible for overseeing Enron's financial statements as corporate governance crumbled at Enron. Anderson found itself entangled in the wreckage. So we do really appreciate the fact that the Enron scandal, massive scandal, it's one of the scandals. If you've not already watched it, that I would recommend you can find a clip, you can find multiple clips down on YouTube just describing the Enron scandal and how it just bathed a lot of corporate governance frameworks in the US and in the world at large. It's so important to really just check it out check out some of the scandals we've seen um, across you know um, the, the, the particular corporate space uh, Enron is one of those by the way and we then see here that what happened so Anderson's failure to maintain independence and objectivity in its role as Enron's auditor dealt a severe blow to its reputation it's it's actually interesting to note that they were caught shredding um, evidence, you know, that could easily implicate them and um, Enron as well. So what happened as we close the curtains of that story? How did it end? So in the aftermath, Anderson faced legal and regulatory consequences leading to the demise of the once prestigious firm. Wow. The Enron scandal tends to serve as a cautionary tale, emphasizing the vital link between corporate governance and the role of the external auditors. Now, let's look at how it can be tested in Section A. So we have a question here that's talking about Serena. You know, Serena Company is a company listed on a stock exchange. It provides specialist training in accounting and finance. You are an audit manager at Possum and Company, and you are considering a number of governance issues which have arisen. Now, the chairman recently received correspondence from a shareholder who is concerned that Serena does not comply fully with corporate governance principles. Serena's companies comprises of four executives who originally set up a company or set up their company and two non-executive directors. The board has not established an audit committee and no internal audit function has been set up to monitor the system of internal control. Now, I borrowed this from a question um, known as Serena and the Study Hub. And you can really see here in the last part of that part of all these three paragraphs that I've mentioned that there are a few issues. You know, the board comprises of four executives, two non-executives, there's no balance really um we can see here there's a mention of the audit committee as well there's not there's an the board has not established one there's no internal audit function so we have multiple um issues there but the question was being asked was asked which two of the following this is a section a question where we have a case the case on the left and the question on the right so which two of the following describes the benefits to serena company of forming the audit committee so we are given four choices here the audit committee will provide a formal link between the auditor non-executive directors and the shareholders i believe that is true they do form a link between the auditor and the NEDs and the shareholders. So they're very well uh, positioned. Um, the audit committee will assume, and you have to appreciate by the way that the audit committee only comprises of two or three, normally three for larger companies, um, non-executive directors, okay? Now the audit committee will assume responsibility for making decisions regarding the appointment and the remuneration. No, they don't. That's the remuneration committee's job. Um, it's interesting to know that they're asking you for two. 
So if I chose only A and I chose B as well and B is wrong, then what would happen is that I would get it wrong. <laughs> That's the problem with choices. You know, you choose and you get all of them right or you get all of them wrong. It's like making choices in life, my God. The beauty is that we are given second chances in life, isn't it? Now, the audit committee will assume responsibility for the company's financial statements and budgets. No, they won't. That's not their job. These are internal aspects. This is going to be dealt with by executive directors normally. They are the ones who will focus a lot on the financial statements and then the budgets. The audit committee could help review the systems around how those things were prepared, but they won't necessarily take responsibility for them. Then an audit committee can monitor and review, yes they can, the company system of internal control. So I'll take A and D as my answer. Then another thing here, um, the second way for it to be examined is in section B. So you told here in respect of the corporate governance of saxophone enterprises company, it's a longer question, but I just wanted to show you how we can really answer it. So we're told here, identify and explain. It's very important to um, appreciate those breakdowns. Identify, explain. Identify, explain. Most students just stop at identifying and they don't necessarily explain. So you have to be very careful with how do I explain. So identify first five corporate governance weaknesses from a scenario. There will normally be more than five, maybe there would be seven, but explaining is the part that also a lot of us fail to get and you'd find that identifying is half a mark explaining is another half a mark and then giving an appropriate recommendation is one mark so if you're given five corporate governance weaknesses to do this this could be a total of 10 marks now as you told here the total marks will be split equally there's usually like a table there where you'll have corporate governance weaknesses and the recommendations 10 marks as you can see so Let's just pick up one, okay? So we had this scenario in the question where there was a guy called Bill Bassoon and he was the chairman of saxophone until last year he was the C CEO. As you can see, he's not stayed for a very long time um, since he's an executive director and now they've made him the chair. And the chair is one position that needs to be held by the independent an independent non-executive director. Now, Bill is unsure if saxophone needs more non-executive directors as there are currently three non-executive directors out of eight, which means that the board is not balanced. There are three NEDs and the board is eight, which means that there are five executive directors. And that's a very imbalanced situation. Now, I can decide to focus on the first part, which is um, speaking about Bill Bassoon, right? Or I can focus more on the imbalanced proportion. Or I can even mention both of them. But let me focus on one, just to see how to explain the weakness. So the board comprises five executives and only three non-executive directors. That's you identifying. How do I explain it? So the executive directors can dominate the board's decision making. Why is that a problem? Because it could lead to unfavorable decisions against shareholders. You see, you're showing why it's a problem. When you tell me about a weakness, you have to go and explain to me why is that a weakness? Why is that a problem? Okay, you have to go to that extra mile to give clarity, to communicate through your writing. Why is that a problem? Then it goes on to say here, the recommendation, at least half of the board should comprise of independent non-executive directors. That's fantastic. But you've not yet given me a recommendation. You've just stated the objective. If I stopped there, that would not be a full mark because I've only stated what is the best situation. I need to go on and, go on and explain why is that a favorable situation. Hence, the board of saxophones should consider recruiting and appointing an additional two non-executive non directors. Now, that's good. You're talking about action. What should they do? Recruit, appoint two additional non-executive directors. That, that's the action. That's the point that will now give your recommendation. Fantastic. It will be a fantastic, solid answer. Now, as I end, step one, these are just my final tips. You know, 
when you want to basically tackle this area read you know get knowledge get information really understand what corporate governance is what do the OECD's principles say what do the UK corporate governance principles say just to really understand um, that particular area right in terms of just reading read get information attempt the short quizzes normally at the very end of the chapter in the study hub and then from there reread it for understanding you know um, it doesn't hurt to do something twice uh, it, it is more experience. It, it, it gives you a better understanding of things. It helps you to see things that you never saw before. And then from there, attempt the practice questions. These ones are longer. These ones are normally worth 10 marks or so. This will give you a better um, appreciation of how you would encounter them in the exam. And then, calm down. You got this. Thanks for watching. And do have a fantastic time ahead as you delve into corporate governance. Thank you.